All right, if we can turn to the book of Esther and chapter 8, please. I'm going to read the entire chapter. It's 17 verses long, and it's concerning uh, the hateful decree uh, that had been made by Haman and published. Although Haman is dead, the decree still stands. And so it's a very vital issue that needs to be dealt with, this horrible decree. And so I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. It says, On that day did the king Ahasuerus give the house of Haman, the Jew's enemy, unto Esther the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was unto her. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it unto Mordecai, and Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. And Esther spake yet again before the king, and fell down at his feet, and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite, and his device that he had devised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther, so Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which were in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come unto my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Then the king Ahasuerus said unto Esther the queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you, in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring, for the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is the month Sivan, on the three and twentieth day thereof, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews and to the lieutenants, and the deputies and rulers of the provinces, which are from India unto Ethiopia, a hundred twenty and seven provinces, unto every province according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, to the Jews according to their writing and according to their language. And he wrote in the king Ahasuerus' name and sealed it with the king's ring and sent letters by posts on horseback and riders on mules, camels, and young dromedaries, wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Upon one day, in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar. The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people, and that the Jews should be ready against that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. So the post that rode upon mules and camels went out, being hastened and pressed on by the king's commandment. And the decree was given at Shushan the palace. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white and with a great crown of gold and with a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. And again, God indeed will bless that reading from his precious word to us. Now, just to break down this chapter, chapter 8, 
Uh, we're going to see in verses one and two, Mordecai's promotion, uh, how he has been promoted to be the prime minister, basically, of the land. And then we're going to see Esther's petition, particularly uh, of interest to us in verses three through eight. And then the king's proclamation, uh, which will be sent throughout the empire in verses 9 through 14. And then finally, the Jews' pleasure in verse 15 through 17 at receiving this good news decree, as opposed to the one that had hung over their heads before. And so we said, although the wicked Haman is dead, yet the hateful decree issued when he was prime minister still stood and was in effect. And so this chapter deals with that very important issue. It begins, though, with Haman's estate being given to Esther by the king, and then, of course, uh, Esther giving it to somebody who would be a very faithful steward of it uh, for her, uh, none other than Mordecai. So we're going to see his promotion. Persian law uh, gave the state the power to confiscate the property of those who had been condemned as criminals. And if you remember last time, land is recently boasted back in chapter 5, verse 11. Uh, we'll just read that. It says, and Haman told them of the glory of his riches. All of the glory of his riches now passed on to the state. It became what we would say the property of the crown. And it was the king's prerogative to do with this confiscated property whatever he willed. And perhaps a, an act of generosity on his part, uh, but also perhaps even atoning for his foolish decisions that he had made and the tremendous distress that it had brought upon his beautiful wife, Esther, uh, he gives this entire estate to her to do with as she chooses, no doubt his conscience being somewhat appeased in the process. And so it says again in verse 1, on that day did King Ahasuerus give the house of Haman, Haman the, the Jew's enemy, unto Esther the queen. And so uh, it's passed on uh, to Esther. And notice it's the second time, by the way, in the book that we have this term, Haman, the Jew's enemy. The first time uh, in chapter 3, verse 13, was uh, after the, the very, uh, well, not, not just the first time. It's, yeah, first time in 310. Uh, we had wicked Haman before that. But the first time he's called the Jew's enemy is in chapter 3, verse 10, where it says the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And what contrasting circumstances that phrase, the Jew's enemy, is used. Initially, uh, he had tremendous power. Uh, he had the means to, to make the Jews suffer, uh, was keen to do it. And now, of course, everything's been reversed and he has lost his life. And uh, he's just referred to as a historical footnote now as Haman, the Jew's enemy. All his lands passed on to Esther. And at that moment, it seems that it was appropriate for Esther to disclose her full relationship with Mordecai. And so again, it says in verse one, and Mordecai came before the king for Esther had told what he was unto her. And we've said that actually he was her cousin, obviously significantly older. But if you remember back in chapter 2 and verse 7, um, Esther 2 verse 7, it says he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. Okay, so again, his father and her father were brothers which makes them cousins, his uncle's daughter. Now, again, in a family, it could be uh, that uh, his father was much older uh, than Esther's father, so she could be much younger 
but nevertheless, that's how the relationship. So uh, their fathers being brothers. He had adopted her as an orphan into his care, raised her as her foster father and guardian. And uh, so it tells us now that Mordecai came before the king. Uh, not only is he introduced to the court, uh, but he was now uh, one of those who was privileged to see the face of the king. If you remember back in chapter 1 and verse 14, uh, we saw a list of those that were given that privilege to see the, see the face of the king. And it says uh, the next unto him was, and it gives a list of individuals which saw the king's face and which sat, sat the first in the kingdom. And now uh, Mordecai came before the king. He is one of them that is now given this uh, special position uh, to be one of the king's uh, close advisors uh, be, being brought before the king. And yet it's going to get better than, than that. Not only is he one of those close advisors, he's actually going to take the place of Haman because it says the king took off his ring, verse 2, which he had taken from Haman and gave it unto Mordecai and Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. And so among the high officials, not only was he one of those privileged to see the face of the king, he was now specially privileged for the king had given him his ring, which was with this ring. That's how documents were sealed that had that official stamp, as it were, of the authority of the king. And he now has that uh, in his power. And so by this act, Mordecai was advanced to the post of first minister of the king. And if you look at back in Genesis chapter 41, uh, it reminds us of the position that Joseph once was also given. And so we're going we're to just think about this. This is uh, in terms of Gentile uh, empires. Uh, this is at the peak of Jewish power. Verse 42 it says, uh, Genesis 41, it says, Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. He made him to ride in the second chariot, so on and so forth. What's different in this occasion is that you have a Jewish queen and a Jewish prime minister in the Persian Empire. Uh, so again, you think of that incredible influence now that the Jews have uh, in that condition that they're in. So Mordecai becomes prime minister of the empire. Remarkable to think about this. One moment uh, the Jews are faced with extinction. Now they have not only the queen, but the prime minister are Jewish. So the royal ring had been taken back from Haman, this insignia of authority of the throne. And uh, we can certainly see that uh, throughout the book, that this ring had great significance. It really was a ring of power. Uh, if you look at chapter 8, for instance, in verse 8, write ye also to, for the Jews as it liketh you in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse. Again, verse 10. Uh, he wrote in the king Ashwara's name and sealed it with the king's ring. So you can just see how much power is connected with this ring. Back in chapter 3 and verse 12, again, you saw it. It says, now when every maid's turn had come to go into uh, king, ah, that's chapter 2. That's why it's not looking so good. Chapter 3, verse 12. We read this. Then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants, to the governors that were over every province, and to the rulers of every people of every province, according to the writing thereof, to every people after their language, in the name of King Ahasuerus was it written and sealed with the king's ring. So you can see how significant this document is really was or this ring really was it was a tremendous ring of power uh, and certainly it is now passed uh, into the hands of Mordecai as well as that we have this other reference to the fact that he was now also 
uh, set by Esther. Uh, again, at the end of verse two, it says, and gave it to Mordecai, and Esther set Mordecai, Mordecai over the house of Haman. And so he becomes really the manager of Esther's newly acquired estate, all that had belonged to Haman. And again, we, we see a, a fulfillment in one sense of what is written in Psalm 37. And it's, it's a delightful kind of summary of the events that we've been witnessing as we've looked at Esther together. And Psalm 37, verses 34, Psalm 37, verse 34, down to verse 36, it says this, Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. And so Esther, uh, in the book of Esther, you see Haman spreading himself in his pride and his wickedness like a green page, bay tree. And then he's gone. Uh, he's gone from the scene. And instead, the one who waited on the Lord kept his way. He was exalted to inherit the land. And of course, we see that ultimately, don't we? That uh, the wicked are going to have their day in the sunshine, so to speak. But in a coming day, it's not going to be the wicked that inherit the earth. They're grasping for power. They want it, but they're not going to get it. It says the meek shall inherit the earth. And uh, again, those that uh, walk with the Lord, those that follow him, they're the ones that are going to be the inheritors of the earth. And uh, it's just good to be reminded of that. And we see a foreshadowing of it here in the book of Esther. So Esther had inherited a large estate indeed. And she, she did need a steward to oversee and manage it for her because this phrase, uh, Haman's household or the house of Haman, uh, would be much more than just the actual physical property. It would also mean the, the, not only the building and its furnishings, but it would also be the entire household, uh, all the servants, slaves, all the uh, the household that were, you know, this is, you know, kind of the prime minister's uh, uh, household uh, with everybody in, involved, a large train of attendants and servants of various kind, and they would now all come under the authority of Mordecai. And so he has been uh, promoted to that position. So we've seen Mordecai's promotion. He's the prime minister. He is also the manager of Haman's great estate. And now we come to a very challenging portion uh, for us, we'll see, as well as in the book for Esther in verses three through eight, Esther's petition. It says, and Esther spake yet again before the king and fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. You see, wealth, which she had, prestige, personal security, could never satisfy Esther as long as her people were still in danger. And they are in danger. To, to her, the most important thing in life now was not her comfort, but their deliverance. And she couldn't rest until the matter was settled, because this hateful decree is still hanging over the heads of her people. And again, she's, she's so different to many believers today, because uh, there's a horrible as it were, threat hanging over the human race. And many believers are enjoying the wealth of their spiritual inheritance and hardly bear a, sh a thought or shed a tear for those who are under such a terrible threat of eternal damnation because they do not respond to the gospel and do not hear the gospel. And I wonder if we could be moved like Esther. She could not rest. She couldn't settle enjoying all that she had when she knew that her people were ready to perish. So we, we see here, she's interceding at the throne, 
to save a lost people from slaughter. That was what she was doing. And she's doing it with tears. Over the years, there are many who have prayed for the Jews. And they've interceded on behalf of a wayward people more than once. I just read in my readings recently in the book of Exodus in chapter 32, where uh, God was about to wipe out Israel and build a new nation from Moses. And Moses was so desperate interceding for his people that he was even willing, if it were possible, for God to blot his name out of the book of life that his people might be rescued. Centuries later, the Apostle Paul, as we know, was also willing, if it was possible, to be a curse from Christ if his people could only be converted in Romans 9, 1 through 3. It's interesting that the lack of intercession on behalf of a lost people marks much of contemporary Christianity. And it's interesting that R.A. Torrey, a uh, great servant of God of a former generation, said this, the devil is perfectly willing that the church should multiply its organizations and its deftly contrived machinery for the conquest of the world for Christ, if it will only give up praying. Isn't that interesting? Doesn't mind. <laughs> the devil doesn't mind organizations and all kinds of clever machinery. In fact, he's delighted as long as we give up praying. It was a master stroke of the devil when he got the church and the ministry to generally lay aside the mighty weapon of prayer. <laughs> interesting, isn't it? And so <clears throat> one concerned person devoted to prayer can make a great difference in the world. But prayer is the key that releases the power of God. And as we'll see in this chapter, it begins with Esther sowing in tears. It ends with the people reaping in joy. <laughs> it's a tremendous joyful crescendo at the end of this particular chapter. So she fell down at his feet, it says, and besought him with tears. The saintly Matthew Henry says this, every tear as precious as any of the pearls which she adorned. Esther, though safe herself, fell down and begged with tears for the deliverance of her people. And so it tells us in verse 4, then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king. So again, she's she's been bold and she's risked her life again. And see, I mean, we, remember we saw that if you don't, if you're not called into the presence of the king, it's like a death sentence unless he holds out the golden scepter. So once again, we see Esther. She she's risking her life because she's concerned about her people, and so. She, she approaches the king without invitation. <clears throat> She's already pleaded for her own life, and she'd pleaded for the life of her people. Back in chapter 7 and verse 3 and 4, uh, she says, verse 4, for we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed. But somehow it seems that in all the ensuing turmoil, uh, Haman's execution, all the rest of it, the matter of the edict against her people had been overlooked. And so this matter had to be dealt with. So she stands before the king in verse five. She says this and said, if it please the king, and I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seemed right before the king, and I be, be pleasing in his eyes. Let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces. Now, here we go again. Notice um, how uh, she uh, uses all the right protocol. Uh, she, she comes in, she great, shows great deference uh, to him. Uh, if it would please the king, if she had found favor in his sight, if it seemed right and proper to him, if she herself were pleasing in his eyes, would he hear the petition? 
And some critics have said that, you know, this is needless repetition. It seems like each time she goes in, she goes through this. But again, it's showing that even though he was her husband, she still recognized that he was her Lord and King. And so she always used the appropriate protocol. And again, I think it's good for us to be reminded that as we come into the presence, we, we're encouraged to come, right? We don't decept us down. We, we're encouraged to come and, and we can come boldly to the throne of grace, but we don't come cockily or with any kind of arrogance. We come with reverence into his presence. Even though we enjoy intimacy with, with the Lord now, there still should be that sense of reverence in coming into his very presence. And she comes revealing her sincerity, the earnestness that's in her heart. And she, she comes reverently and respectfully for the king, before the king. And of course, she would desire that this horrible decree be reversed. Now, of course, there's a problem. And the problem we can see in other scriptures is that something written in the king's name and sealed with the king's seal is irreversible. It cannot be changed. And we know that from the great book of Daniel. And if you remember uh, in Daniel chapter six, part of the reason Daniel finds himself in the lion's den, even though when the king realizes what had happened to him, he was powerless to do anything about it. Look at Daniel chapter six, because of the law of the Medes and the Persians, which changes not. Verse 8 of Daniel 6, Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Chapter 6, verse 12. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. And again, verse 15, Then these men assembled to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is there no decree nor statute which the king established may be changed. And of course, the king member stayed up all night. Uh, he was he, he tried everything within his power to change the decree so that Daniel couldn't be thrown into the den of lions. But there was nothing that he could do. He was he was caught by his own decree, uh, the decree of the of the laws of the Medes and the Persians. And so this is this decree cannot be reversed. That has already been signed. That Haman had written out. It was an unalterable edict authorized by, by Ahasuerus, dispatched in letters throughout the empire, and it could not be changed. Notwithstanding all of this, Esther pleads that the king might reverse the letters. It was a shrewd thing, notice, that she says here uh, when she appeals. Uh, she, she Notice how she describes it in verse 5, to reverse the letters devised by Haman the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces. Uh, she, she points out no blame being placed on the king. This was all the device of that wicked Haman. So she does it in very cle a clever way, uh, not pushing any blame on the king. This is all the work of Haman, the Agagite. And again, she continues to plead in verse six, how can I endure to see the evil that shall come to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? And again, I have a note in my Bible, don't know when I wrote it, but I put, Lord, teach me to intercede on behalf of those who are ready to perish. <laughs> uh, give me that kind of heart that I just can't endure. And some in history have had that kind of a burden that they could hardly endure. Uh, just reading the other day about uh, praying hide of India, 
and he prayed with such earnestness that actually this is a medically verified his heart moved from one side of his body to the other side and they actually have x-ray evidence he was you talk about a man with a broken heart he actually prayed with such earnestness for lost souls in india that his heart moved from one side to the other and i i feel so uh, condemned in a sense because i I, I feel like I'm just so not like that. Uh, and I pray, Lord, give me a heart and a burden to intercede on behalf of the people that are destined to destruction. So that says in verse 7, then King the king Ahasuerus said to Esther, the queen, to Mordecai, the Jew, behold, I have given Esther the house of Ammon, and him they have hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews, as it liketh you, in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse. Again, here's that. It's written. It can't be changed. It can't be altered. And so, um, as we've said, the Persian government was a constitutional monarchy. The king had to obey the laws of the land. One of the laws was the, what we call the law of the Medes of Persians, which said, and once established, it could not be reversed. So the only hope was if they could write some other decree that would somehow, and again, he, he says, you figure it out, but, but you can write another decree and I'll sign it, that may somehow help to protect the Jews. We can't reverse the original dec decree. It can't be done. So he basically says, you've got my ring. We can't reverse the first decree, but you can make another one. And so he puts the ball in Mordecai's court. And so how does Mordecai handle this? Well, what he does is, although the decree uh, stated that the death decree still stood, he writes another decree giving the Jews the right to band together and defend themselves. Okay, so the, the decree, the initial decree stands, decree stands, but now there's another one that's going to be written that's going to give the Jews the right to defend themselves. And again, we, we think about the how unchangeable decrees. Here's an un, unchangeable decree. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. It's an unchangeable decree. Uh, it, it's happened from, from the fall of man, right? Uh, the day you sin, you shall die. And yet God has brought in another decree, a beautiful decree. The wage of sin is death. But what the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And how thankful we are that even though we were under the first decree, there's another decree that whoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so praise God that the law is unalterable. But now there's a means by which people can don't have to defend themselves, just have to simply believe that God has made a provision. And what a wonderful thing it is that there is that ability to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. So notice verse uh, 9, it says, Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is the month Sivan, on the three and twentieth day thereof, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews and to the lieutenants and the deputies and rulers of the provinces, which from India to Ethiopia, 120 and seven provinces, unto every province according to the writing thereof, unto every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writing, according to their language. So they're, they're given the, the job, the scribes, um, that uh, the letter that would be composed uh, by Mordecai would be translated into all the languages of the 127 provinces in the king's name, sealed with the king's ring as the earlier letter. It would have royal authority equal with that of the first letter, and it would be carefully and suitably phrased without annulling the former edict yet cancelling out, in a sense, its awful effect and preserving the people from destruction by giving them the right to defend themselves. And it would be irreversible. 
And so the scribes are called at once. And again, you wonder just about this, is this the same scribes that just a short while before had written out the initial decree, now writing out this new decree? Not only was it done in all the languages, but it also had to be sent a document in Hebrew, the Jewish language, for all of those provinces as well. So the Jews, it's important that they read this. <laughs> they need to know this, that they have the right to defend themselves. And so there's great emphasis here on making sure that the Jews, according to their writing, according to their language, they had access to know that they could defend themselves legitimately. And so this king's proclamation, a new decree in favor of the Jews, allowing them to assemble, to defend themselves, but they weren't allowed to be the ag aggressors. Notice that they, they could defend themselves. They were not to, to go after anybody, but if anybody came after them, they were allowed to defend themselves. Now, this decree, according to verse 9, it was done on a certain day, the 23rd day of the third month, uh, which would be, uh, we can actually say specifically, this would be June 25th, 474 BC. June 25th, 474 BC. The Jewish calendar begins in the month of April, if we remember that, uh, from the Passover. So this is the third month, April, May, June. And the first Issue, a decree was issued on April 17th, and we know that from chapter 3 and verse 12. Uh, we're given the detail. In chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded, first month being April. And so 13th day, remember, that would just be the day before Passover, 14th day of the first month would be the killing of the Passover. So <clears throat> there's about 70 days had passed since Haman had declared war on the Jews. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the D-Day, uh, when their destruction, destruction would come, was March the 7th. Uh, we get that from chapter 3, verse 13. The letters were sent by post unto all the king's provinces to destroy and kill, to cause to perish all the Jews, both young and old, little children, women, in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to take spoil of them for a prey. And so they had about eight months to get themselves ready, right? So from June to March, to prepare themselves uh, to defend themselves. So to get whatever was necessary for their self-defense. And it's interesting that we need to make a distinction here that there's a big difference between the self-defense of the Jews and the genocide that had previously been decreed. One was a very serious sin, right? They were wiping out the entire race. Self-defense was a very different thing. It's amazing uh, J. Vernon McGee, that uh, Texas preacher uh, who, with his notoriously uh, southern accent, said this, the Jew has attended the funeral of every one of the nations that tried to exterminate him. And it is amazing how uh, one person was asked if he could give one reason to defend the authenticity of the Bible, what would it be? And he said, the Jew, <laughs> the, the very existence of this Jewish people, despite so many satanic attempts to wipe them out, are still here to this day and this hour. Verse 10, he wrote in the king Ahasuerus' name, sealed it with the king's ring, sent letters by post on horseback, and riders on mules, camels, and young dromedaries. So Mordecai would dictate the letter. The scribes would write as he commanded. These same men who had transcribed Haman's wicked letter some two months earlier. The letter was urgent. It was important that it be sent with a sense of urgency. And so there, it, it, the, the Jews of the kingdom should know not only to prepare themselves, but for their comfort. Can you imagine 
the comfort that would come to them when they knew that they were able legitimately to defend themselves against their enemies. Prior to that, they didn't have that comfort. And so for their peace of mind, just to know their circumstances had changed. Uh, the, yes, the, the, the people still have that first decree. They can still attempt to wipe them out and get a spoil. But now they needed to know that even though they're still a contempt, condemned people, that they have the right to defend themselves. And it was a much better situation. So in verse 11, it says, <clears throat> wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city to gather themselves together, to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for prey. So they're, they're given this permission, no matter who, old or young, that would attack them, even if it was little ones, they could take vengeance upon them and they could defend themselves. And it's by order of the king. This right of organized self-defense against those who would assault them. And it's interesting, the ironical play upon words, because the very same words that are used in the edict that Haman had written, uh, you notice this phrase, to destroy, to slay, to cause, to perish. <laughs> oh, that's the very same language that was in the original decree. Esther had used it when she appealed to the king. Uh, here it's used again. Uh, in this new decree. The same words are used, the same power is given them as were given to their enemies. Not that they made use of it. One of the things that this text is going to tell us as we go proceed is that there was a provision that they could take the spoil of those that attacked them. And one of the things the text is going to tell us is that they didn't do that at all. They didn't take any of the spoil. And I don't know why they didn't do that. I wonder if part of it was knowing how anti-Semiticism is such a reality that if they had have spoiled them as well, that that would have even caused greater resentment. Uh, or these Jews, you see how they got rich. They got rich by killing out people and, and stealing their, their goods. And then the question is about the children. And did they, you notice it does use the, the language of children here, uh, beginning verse 11, uh, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. And all it's saying is that if the attacker who attacked them <laughs> included little ones and children, they could get vengeance upon them. I would suspect, again, if they're not going to take the spoil, I could hardly see them. Uh, viciously killing the women and children unless they were specifically attacked by them. And so it tells us in verse 12, upon one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, is namely on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, the copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that the Jews should be ready against that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. So the posts that rode upon mules and camels went out being hastened and pressed on by the king's commandment. And again, we have to ask ourselves the question, are we being hastened and pressed on by the king's commandment? Do you remember the Lord Jesus, what he said? All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth, go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, lo, I am with you always. And so we have a commandment from the king himself. These posts, these messengers were hastened, and I like that language, pressed on. It pressed them on, the king's commandment, to get this message out. And do we know anything about being hastened and pressed on by the king's commandment that we might uh, get the decree out uh, that for those that are ready to perish, <laughs> that there is a means which by which they can enjoy complete deliverance. And in contrast to the Jews, they don't have to, this what message we have is not something you have to do yourself. It's something that somebody else has done for you. You have to just believe it 
and put your faith in what the Lord Jesus did on Calvary. But notice now the uh, in verse 15 through 17, and we've seen a lot about Mordecai's rise. Uh, we've seen his now a manager, a steward of a larger state. He's now the prime minister, and now he's got a new outfit. It says, Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white and with a great crown of gold, with a garment of fine linen, purple, and the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. No longer was he wearing borrowed apparel. Remember that uh, in the when he was paraded in chapter 6 uh, to the chagrin of, uh, Mord uh, of uh, Haman, uh, it was the royal apparel was brought for the, uh, the the king used to wear so it was was the king's castoffs that he wore the first time but now it would seem he's going out in royal apparel specially made for him uh, not borrowed and these are now his not just for a short time there are these new robes prepared especially for him as prime minister and he left the palace in splendid array clothed in royal apparel of blue and white fine linen and all the rest of it and this crown now it's not the crown royal it's a very different word uh to the word that's used uh frequently in this book uh, as the crown royal like for instance in chapter 1 verse 11 it says bring vashti the queen before the king with a crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty for she was fair to look upon uh chapter 2 verse 17 again we have the the royal crown mentioned again it says the king loved esther above all the women she obtained grace and favor and is upon her uh, this word is a different word and it simply is the idea of a wreath or coronet uh, and again, it was certainly a, a symbol of delegated authority, but it, he didn't have the royal crown on his head, but he certainly displayed in uh, beautiful royal apparel and um, off he goes. And not also not only now he's got a new outfit, he's got a new position and uh, he has new authority. And again, I think of the believer in the Lord Jesus. What about us? We have a new outfit, don't we? Uh, we're clothed, or robed in the righteousness of God. Uh, we, we have new authority. Uh, he, the, the Lord Jesus has conferred authority upon us. Uh, all authority is given to me. Go therefore in, in his name, in his authority. And we certainly have a new position. Uh, we're seated in heavenly places. So we're in a marvelous position as well. Notice it says, the Jews had light and gladness and joy. Uh, the city of Shushan, the end of verse 15, uh, they rejoiced and were glad. Remember when the initial decree had come to the city of Shushan? It says that the whole city was perplexed, but now they're rejoicing and glad. They felt there was something terrible about this original decree, but now there's a different attitude in the city of Shushan. And th the language is all about rejoicing. And I remember I said earlier, Psalm 126, verse 5, very, very relevant because it began, our chapter began with tears, the tears of Esther. And our chapter ends with great joy. Psalm 26 and verse 5, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Sowing in tears, reaping in joy. And that's exactly what we see here. The chapter begins with Esther sowing in tears, and now her people, the Jewish people, are rejoicing. Shushan rejoiced. The Jews had light. In other words, the idea is that they were under a heavy burden, right? This decree, and now there's a new lightness. There's a spring, a spring in their step. They have gladness. They have joy. They have honor. In every province, in every city, with us of the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness to feast in a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of Jews fell upon them. And so what we see is a, a kind of a bit of a revival scene, don't we? Uh, this, this is what a revival looks like. 
the people are now filled with with incredible joy instead of a heavy burden and others are seeing what god has done for them and they are somehow the fear of the jews is falling upon them such was the wonder of these events that many people of the land became jews as proselytes they, they'd seen what god had done and they judged it best <laughs> to align themselves with this favored people and they were amazed at what god had wrought through the jews so i just want to think about esther esther and mordecai in our final thoughts here because at the beginning of the story esther and mordecai were hardly exemplary in the way they practiced their uh, religious faith but now we see that everything's changed both of them have nailed their colors to the mast they've affirmed their jews they're not hiding it anymore uh, they, they've got their as it were their identity their heart on their sleeves there it's everybody knows mordecai the jew and esther the queen is also jewish so both of them have affirmed their identity and they were also the means god used to call the nation to fasting and we would say by implication along with that prayer and now as a result of that they were really spearheading a revival or, or we might say an awakening <laughs> because as a result of their change now many of the people of the land became jews for the fear of the jews fell upon them it was considered no longer a reproach to be jewish in the empire but it was actually a badge of honor to be known as a jew in the empire and it all comes back to esther and mordecai nailing their colors to the mast and if we as christians would really nail our colors to the mast one wonders what difference it would make in our world sadly sometimes it's hard to tell who a christian is and who a christian isn't in our world uh, we have the profession but sometimes it's we're hiding it under a bushel <laughs> may the lord encourage us with this incredible chapter that begins with tears and ends with joy amen